Good afternoon and welcome to Bariatric Friday. Today is February 2nd, 2024. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Isaiah Erdal. Uh, Dr. Gah, how are you doing? I'm doing great, uh, Kamal. It's uh, great to be back on yet another wonderful Bariatric Friday. Absolutely. So, um, well, every day, that's what we do, right? So uh, we start the day with bariatric and finish it with bariatric. So uh, our goal is to provide most support, uh, extra support for our patients who are going through the process and also for those who may be dealing with morbid obesity. Uh, also, we want to be uh, another channel for them to actually learn and understand what morbid obesity is and how it's treated. Uh, that's why uh, Dr. Ergao is one of the most experienced surgeons in the uh, bariatric field. He's with me, um, and everything that you hear from us is coming from a clinician. Uh, so we try to take uh, the process in different topics and then try to provide these informations for our patients. So uh, just to kind of maybe recap, Dr. Ergao, on the qualifications. Uh, I say qualification just because... Uh, that's what we have been using in the industry, but who are uh, able to actually receive the surgery? And then we'll start with our topic for today for the care coordination part of uh, bariatric surgery. Absolutely. So as you said, uh, uh, bariatric surgery uh, is a uh, treatment um, modality for uh, excessive weight, weight that has gone really extreme. And uh, we do have very clear guidelines as to ben who benefits the most with the surgery, right? And currently our guidelines are that a person has to be at least 100 pounds over their ideal body weight to be candidates for bariatric surgery. And that essentially means that if a person, uh, for instance, if they are five foot five inches in height and we say that their ideal or healthy weight is let's say 150 pounds. If that person uh, gains weight uh, over time and now their weight is 250 pounds, it means that they are 100 pounds over their ideal body weight. That is the point where uh, you know, we trigger bariatric surgery as a potential treatment for that person. There is another way to quantify that and that is to talk about body mass index or BMI, that is a calculated number that uh, puts into account the height of the person and the weight of the person. And if that number is 40 or higher, then that person is a candidate for bariatric surgery. Sometimes even a body mass index lower than that, let's say 35 kilograms per meter square or higher, can make a person a candidate for weight loss surgery or bariatric surgery. If that person has also developed certain illnesses that are commonly associated with excessive weight, for instance, type 2 diabetes or high blood pressure or sleep apnea. Uh, a person can calculate their body mass index by going online. For instance, they can go into our website at creas.com and uh, they can actually put their height and their weight and it will give them their body mass index to see if uh, bariatric surgery is something that they can uh, look into. So, uh, Dr. Gao, we um, categorize bariatric surgery one of the most efficient tools uh, to fight morbid obesity. Of course, there are other ways uh, to actually lose weight. But our patients uh, in the category of uh, morbid obesity, uh, and this is a different level, uh, are there some miracles? Yes, uh, we do have some miracles. There are, uh, there are some patients uh, maybe one in 1,000 or one in 10,000, they may be able to lose weight by diet and exercise, but it's not the case uh, for uh, most of our patients. And yet still it's only used by 1% of these who are qualified to have this surgery, uh, knowing that this is the most efficient way to do it. Uh, that's still very underutilized. Um, so for those who don't understand morbid obesity, uh, and like whether or not this is a chronic illness. Uh, if there are two patients, one with diabetes, the other one is with morbid obesity, which one do you give the drugs first? Um, because one of them may not be still categorized as uh, perception may still not be the uh, 
uh, chronic illness. So uh, can you just talk about that a little bit? Absolutely, absolutely, Kamal. It's interesting that given the history of uh, morbid obesity as a disease within the medical community is actually recent, right? There was a time in which doctors did not think of morbid obesity as a disease, but they thought it was something that was uh, brought on by people onto themselves and that, you know, they could lose the weight. They just needed to diet and exercise. Well, as obesity increased in its prevalence in our society, in fact, over the last uh, 30 to 40 years, it has gone much, much higher levels everywhere in the mm -hmm. United States. So, so that even 30% uh, of the population actually is either overweight or obese in the United States currently. Mm -hmm. And with that, it, obviously, it increased the prevalence of things like type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure. So doctors were suddenly faced with a situation where they were seeing patients struggling. And the question was, you know, why are they not able to lose weight? Why are people not just diet and exercise and then they're not losing weight? And the first thought was obviously, ah, they're lazy. You know, they don't have the willpower. And yet when you dig into it deeply, you can see that even people with the highest level of willpower, people who can achieve many things that they seek after in life, whether it's in their job, in their professional life, in their education, those very people also struggle with weight, right? And then clearly the medical uh, uh, establishment came to understand that there is something biologic that drives weight. It's not just about willpower. And there is a pathophysiology. There is a disease process behind it just like high blood pressure, just like diabetes or even cancer, right? It's a chronic disease driven by biology, facilitated obviously by the environment, obviously in which we live, where there is high availability of cheap calories and less options and opportunities for people to be physically active. That combination has really created this epidemic. It's a true epidemic and it's a disease. So to tell somebody, or you have obesity, go diet and exercise is unacceptable nowadays. We have to accept that it is a disease. And when it reaches certain levels, come out, it's almost impossible to lose weight with your own means, right? As you said, yes, there are some people who can achieve that, but those are rare exceptions. And we cannot guide ourselves through those rare exceptions. Mm -hmm. We have to look at the population at large. And now, Currently, the most effective treatment we have is bariatric surgery, and it has been recognized universally. Primary care doctors routinely refer and recommend or counsel their patients to look into bariatric surgery as a solution. Now, we know very well it's not a magic answer, meaning that just because you have bariatric surgery, now you free yourself from morbid obesity. Far from that, it's a biologically driven disease, which means that that tendency will be there as well. So alongside bariatric surgery, it's critically important to adapt a healthy lifestyle with how a person eats, when they eat, what they eat, but also how active they are physically. So bariatric surgery has to be incorporated with a change in lifestyle that will guarantee that obesity never comes back in that person's life. Absolutely. So. Uh... One of the main uh, elements of uh, bariatric surgery from our program standpoint is our care coordination. And you and I, we work together to develop this uh, uh, care coordination part of the uh, uh, bariatric surgery process. And as we have done uh, this in different facilities, uh, we, have, we didn't have full freedom uh, in some of these hospital uh, facilities. Uh, and once we have our own facility at American Surgery Center, then we decided that, okay, we have to do this in our way. And our way was different than um, the way that we were doing before. So I would say since 2018, since we started the bariatric surgery process in the surgery center, uh, now we are doing it differently. So this biggest difference is we have our nurses assigned to uh, our patients, so they have designated person to, to deal with, and not only they are just being um, coming into the program and mentioned only once, but they are uh, patients are part of the program every day, 
uh, every day they have follow-ups and different things that they have to do. We actually uh, actually hold hands with them and make sure that they get the most support. Because we know that during this process, one of the uh, issues that we deal with is the fear. One of the issues that we deal with is the um, social uh, stigma and peer pressure and all those other things that's happening while someone is trying to get ready for the procedure. So the best we could do is to put uh, designated resources and uh, with our daily case conferences, we are able to keep our patients in the program. That's why we have one of the lowest uh, drop rate uh, ratio, dropout ratio, and uh, this is working out so far. So let's actually talk about the different uh, parts of the care coordination. If you can actually just start the process and then I'll join you. Absolutely, absolutely. So as you correctly say, uh, care coordination is critical, right? And why is that? Well, because we have long recognized, Kamal, that a multidisciplinary preparation of the bariatric patient leads to better outcomes, right? Better outcomes in terms of long-term weight loss, in terms of compliance, in terms of uh, improvement of health conditions related to obesity. Yeah. But this multidisciplinary preparation requires a coordination, right? And the care coordinator team, like the one we have at the American Surgery Center, is like the central nervous system of this, right? It really guides the patients through this process which can be very difficult to navigate if you don't have enough knowledge of it. Obviously, patients come to us they're naive. They don't know all the ins and outs of the preparation. We are the experts. Now, providing information is one thing, but it may not be enough. You have to be able to handhold the patients and navigate, help them navigate the system so that they can uh, easily interface with the different members of that multidisciplinary team uh, without really prolonging the process unnecessarily. And that's what the care coordination is very important. Now, this central nervous system of our program, which is the care coordination team, has to meet on a very regular basis, right? And ours has the highest frequency of meetings, as you correctly said, anywhere in the country. We actually meet on a daily basis. That's, mm -hmm. that's almost unheard of. And who do you have in that? You have, you know, the chairman yourself. There is myself, the clinical director. We have the nurses who are the assigned care coordinators. We have the people in charge of our bariatric center, of the surgery center. And we have the people in charge of our office career. So all the stakeholders that uh, see the patients navigate through them are present. And then we discuss each patient one by one. So where is that patient? Well, they've just started the process. Well, do they have enough uh, orders for them to go to the places where we want them to go? Do they have enough information to go to the appropriate specialist that we have referred them to? Is that close to where they live? Do they have enough time off in their jobs to do it? What kind of times are available in their job for them to do this? Mm -hmm. This granular follow-up can be undertaken only if the care coordination team is meeting on that regular basis. And it's no wonder that we have one of the highest uh, follow-up rates as a program from starting the program to actually undergoing surgery. And that is because of that care coordination. So that care coordination Kamal, is absolutely critical in maintaining the integrity of our multidisciplinary program. And the multidisciplinary program also, alongside the experienced surgeons, guarantees that excellent outcomes with lower complication rates and with long-term follow-up that we are able to uh, attain in our program. So a uh, patient has to go through so many different clearances that we mentioned. Yeah. So just so that we can start um, what they have to do, uh, they have to start with the nutrition uh, classes first. Mm -hmm. So the nutrition probably is one of the most important parts because we want them to learn uh, how to deal with uh, the surgery prior. And also we want them to learn new uh, skills to uh, take care of themselves after the surgery. So nutritionist, dietitian's job is one of the most important one. So we want them to start with that. Then, uh, there, there's always blood work uh, 
that needs to be done, uh, and we would like that to be done as quickly as possible. So this way we'll know whether or not they may need any additional follow-ups. Uh, for example, if they have uh, diabetes and if the A1C is over 8.5, 8, we may ask them to get an endo clearance. Or if their TSH is over 5, um, we may ask again for an endo. If there's any uh, hemoglobin uh, uh, issues, we may ask for uh, hematology. So those things uh, need to start right away. So then we have the cardio um, uh, clearance, which uh, usually is in two different segments with one uh, first initial visit, then they may need to do an ECMO or a stress test. Uh, then they need to get their home sleep study first, so then we can decide, uh, we can uh, diagnose whether or not they have sleep apnea. Uh, they need to get their EGD done, uh, so the EGD is important, so then we can actually understand whether or not, uh, let's say, if they are going for gastric sleeve, uh, and then they have Barrett, then they may need to actually change to gastric bypass. Uh, and then they need to get site clearance, which uh, many people um, who are not really familiar with the process, they don't understand all these clearances. Um, and we'll talk about why these are important and how this is different than any other surgical process. And also we do ask for a bariatrician or maybe in some cases from their primary care. And uh, while they're also going through their uh, surgeon follow-ups. So there are so many different things that they have to do. And yet also we make these videos available so they're able to actually uh, get familiar with some of it because time may be limited. So this is where the assigned nurse, uh, designated nurse would be the most helpful. So um, now, uh, if we were to take it, uh, Dr. Gal, from the EGD, where we see some uh, additional work that needs to be done, if you can kind of maybe elaborate that piece, and then I'll uh, explain the side part of it a little bit. Absolutely. So what is the EGD? And EGD essentially is the esophago gastroduodenoscopy. It's an endoscopy. It's a procedure whereby we are able to examine the inside of the food pipe of the stomach and the upper portion of the intestine to make sure there are there is no disease process that needs to be addressed before bariatric surgery. Because when we do bariatric surgery, whether it's the gastric sleeve, the gastric bypass, or the duodenal switch, we are doing surgery on the upper digestive system, right? And knowing beforehand that there are issues that need to be addressed is important. And sometimes there may be findings that actually will direct the type of surgery that may be appropriate for that patient. As you know, for instance, if we were to discover that the person has Barrett's disease, as you know, we would generally recommend going with the gastric bypass as opposed to the slit gastrectomy. So it's an important evaluation. And uh, so, and but it, it does require coordination, right? The person has to be scheduled. They have to go to our surgery center. They have to be evaluated by anesthesia. They have to take time off. So all that requires coordination. And yet that is only one part of the preparation that is needed before bariatric surgery. And look, from a patient's perspective, Kamal, you know, we know that when patients first think about bariatric surgery as a possible solution of for their weight, they, they reject the idea. They think, you know what, yes, it's not for me. I can do it by myself. And on average, it takes about two years before somebody comes to terms with the fact that, yes, bariatric surgery is an absolute necessity for them. Once they make that decision, they want the surgery the next day. They want it done immediately, right? So when they come to consultation for us, they are really ready and uh, mentally prepared to undergo bariatric surgery. And they wouldn't mind to be scheduled you know, for the surgery for the following week. Uh, so when we tell them that there is preparation, it takes some understanding from their side. But it is important for them to understand that one of the reasons we have made bariatric surgery, one of the safest surgeries performed currently, is because of this thorough preparation that we have to undergo. You know, bariatric surgery, in a way, had to prove itself as a very important form of treatment because of the stigma attached to obesity. And bariatric surgeries were looked upon uh, not as legitimate many years ago. So because of that scrutiny, bariatric surgery had to really prove itself as very, very safe. And it is 
really mind boggling when you think about a sleep gastrectomy has the same levels of safety as a gallbladder surgery or an appendix yeah. surgery, right? And we are able to do that because we have this optimized preparation that goes through this extensive preparation. So when we do endoscopy, we don't want to be surprised by a finding at the time of surgery that may increase the complication rate or 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 lead to aborting the procedure. We want to be prepared and doing the endoscopy helps us to do that. So um, what you just said uh, earlier with uh, the risk of this procedure, uh, this is an outpatient procedure uh, patients are uh, done uh, after their uh, operation. They can be discharged in, uh, in about six hours. So they, they will be home same day. So when you look at uh, the severity of the issue, uh, it's nothing different than gallbladder. Mm -hmm. But yet uh, we need to get through all these processes uh to have the maybe best outcome which again some of them is understandable why is because you know the other day we had a patient the one that i mentioned to you a uh, patient lost 200 pounds so that's like 20 more pounds is me that like she lost me yeah. all um, she was yeah. 145 pounds yeah. yeah so that type of a change as she was still bmi 44 after that Mm -hmm. So imagine that type of a change. Of course, uh, maybe as a, a surgical procedure, it's not uh, any riskier than uh, gallbladder. But the reason we have these uh, clearances is uh, getting the patient ready for these changes as well. So because this is, I mean, with the gallbladder, no one is going to feel like, oh, I don't have the gallbladder anymore six months later. But six months later, when you lost 100 pounds, that's a, that's a huge uh, change. So yes. some of these clearances is for safety reasons, yeah. but some of them is to prep the patient for post-surgical um, uh, outcomes. So now uh, psychological clearance is another one that uh, we have to uh, get, and that's also one of the earlier ones. You know, Dr. Gal, one of the things that I, uh, I'm always uh, still kind of amazed, uh, how many patients who were not diagnosed with certain uh, issues that they have. Uh, like when we get the blood work, we you know, uh, uh, and you and know, I, we can probably name so many different people uh, who had diabetes and they didn't know that they had diabetes. Absolutely. Uh, so many of them have uh, thyroid problems and they didn't know they had those problems. Absolutely. Hemoglobin is one of the uh, you know easiest one. Everyone should be getting their physical ones here and blood work ones here, if, even if they are the most healthiest because this blood work is uh, the most important, uh, uh, the most important element to make those diagnoses or make earlier diagnoses. Yeah, so yeah. then all of a sudden we have the patient with A1C 10, 11, mm -hmm. 12, and then uh, same thing with the hemoglobin. Then now you have to figure out whether or not they have some other reasons some bleeding that is causing this, or do they have some underlying issue? And same thing with the EGDs. So many patients, they don't know that uh, they have... Um, uh, Barrett's disease, yeah. Barrett, but also like the... Um, H. pylori. Uh, H. pylori, right? Yeah. Many, many people, they don't even know that they have. Yeah. Um, and psych is another one where there are, of course, eating disorders, uh, we can categorize everything under eating disorders, but there are some that's dangerous for yes. the individual. There may be some drug-related issues, there may be some alcohol-related issues, mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that these changes, the changes that we are going to have with those patients, they are in the best position to uh, address those, and then we want to make sure that we do our work. Um, now, one of the most also important part of the care coordination processes, we want every patient to activate their patient portal. Yep. Uh, they can communicate with us through the patient portal without any um, uh, issues because phone systems, uh, uh, you know, I'll be honest with everyone. Uh, I also have a primary care practice. No one is able to answer their phones uh, quickly because we don't have that many people, just like the airlines. We don't That's have that. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. People to uh, answer the phones. And you, if you don't want to be on hold for 15, 20 minutes, the most efficient way is to communicate with us 
through patient portals. Yep. And because you have a designated person who will be introducing uh, themselves in the beginning, then you can actually, uh, you'll be definitely getting a, a return a reply in 24 hours. So that way we can kind of eliminate some of the aggravation. And I, I do believe that our office is doing a really good job in terms of um, uh, getting the portal uh, active uh, activation. So um, what else, Dr. Gal? Am I missing anything? No, no. I mean, you know, communication. Communication is clearly key here, right? We have to be all on the same page, right? And to be on the same page, we have to talk to each other, right? So one of the things that are clear is that the bariatric coordinators, who are really the navigators, you know, the they're helping the patients navigate, they have to communicate with them. So there will be texts, there will be emails, there will be phone calls, and that is clearly important, right? And sometimes the patients might get two, three texts a day, and that is to just reassure and, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and confirm that certain appointments were validated, that certain tests were done, because we don't want to miss anything. And we have obviously a very... Uh, very uh, uh, efficient database that, you know, credit to you, Kamal, that was really developed by you, that is so extensive, and yet it has so much depth as well, that it allow us to really uh, utilize it in different settings, right? So we are able to put check marks so that, you know, sometimes, you know, people come and go in different roles, and you can have a bariatric coordinator that maybe is not working with us anymore and another one comes, but the system allows them to land running really without any problem because all they have to do is follow up those, uh, uh, you know, check marks and checklists that we have and communicate continuously with the patients. And you know, as you correctly said, patients may have questions, patients may have um, a change of plans. And if they try to communicate with us by calling our office directly, well, guess what? it may be very difficult because the traffic is so intense. And as you correctly said, not even airlines, that huge multi-billion companies can manage that, right? It's very difficult. So, but we have a way of doing that. If patients are really uh, uh, registered to the patient portal, then they have their own channel of communication. Nobody else, theirs, right? That's their channel. They can communicate with their practice directly. They can communicate with their surgeon directly. And that really facilitates the whole process and nobody is frustrated, right? One of the reasons that there is a very high dropout rate in other programs, Kamal, is because of lack of coordination, right? Lack of communication. People just throw up their arms and they say, okay, it took me seven months, eight months, and I'm still nowhere close to where I need to be. I cannot talk to anybody. We do not want that kind of situation. So the intense rapport that we have between our care coordinators and the patients really results in this very high rate of follow-up that we have in our practice. And it's very interesting, you know, and not uncommon, Kamal, that we will find that some patients actually drop out for other reasons, not for lack of communication, but for other reasons. When they decide to come back, it is as if it never stopped because the mm -hmm. system will just wake up again and their follow-up will be initiated as if, you know, nothing happened and they will resume the process. And of course, they will have to again re-engage with the surgeon. They will have to have discussions about changes that may have happened in their health in the interim and the additional tests may be needed. Some things may need to be repeated or not depending on their particular situation, but the system allows them to really resume the process almost without any interruption. Sure, and one of the uh, things that I uh, wanna remind everyone uh, one of the later, latest uh, Twitter uh, surveys that I had, uh, what challenges have you faced or are currently facing in the pre-op, uh, pre-bariatric -bari pre surgery phase and uh, dietary restrictions and emotional struggles and the life change, lifestyle changes. So those three are 77% uh, total. So all those things require us to be in touch with the patient very closely. So that's why also this care coordination process is very important. Awesome. Now, um, for those who are uh, under 35 uh, BMI, mm -hmm. uh, now we know that BMI may not be the most accurate 
uh, way to measure. But there are some patients who may be at 33, but then their mom body, uh, like the next size may be huge. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They may be proportionate. Uh, they may have a lot of weight on the upper part of their body versus they have skin legs. So there are some other issues where in those cases, we want our patients to talk to the surgeons where we still can help them with the care coordination process as well. And in some cases with the medical necessity, we can actually challenge the insurance companies to make sure that uh, there's a better understanding of health uh, related concerns. Uh, so, because you know we use uh, what we have today, but it may not be the best measure uh, for some cases, but most cases 97% maybe it is the case. So um, any other things that we are missing? I think we covered well, We covered everything. I do, I do want to really follow up on this BMI issue, which is really absolutely correct. BMI is like a crude way for us to decide how severe the impact of obesity is on one's health, right? But it's not precise, as you absolutely correctly say, right? You could have somebody with a body mass index of 32 who already has developed type 2 diabetes, who is already struggling with high blood pressure, who is already struggling with sleep apnea, right, Kamal? So we consider ourselves not necessarily just experts in weight loss, but experts in metabolic disease. And metabolic disease can arise much earlier than the BMI qualification for bariatric surgery. So you're absolutely right. We do want to see patients and we don't want them to continue with their obesity and reach us only at the extremes. We want them to come early to us, right? Because we can help educate them. We can direct them to appropriate, uh, uh, you know, uh, areas, even if they don't qualify for bariatric surgery, they can see Dr. Vani Singh, who is a bariatrician in our network, and she specializes in what's called bariatric medicine. She's a weight management and metabolic disease expert like myself. The only difference is she doesn't do it through surgery, but she can utilize medications and other interventions. So she would be very appropriate for them to see. For patients who may not qualify for the gastric sleeve, we offer, for instance, the gastric balloon, which is an intervention granted, a weaker intervention compared to uh, the sleep gastrectomy. But then we are looking for somebody who may be wanting to lose 30, 35, 40 pounds as opposed to 100 pounds. So absolutely, there should be they should come to us when weight becomes an impediment to their health. And we that is our expertise. Our expertise is to take care of ways that has become an impediment to one's health. Absolutely. Um, so uh, we are going to continue to cover uh, different topics. Um, I'll have new surveys, uh, survey questions coming out, uh, I believe, this weekend. So we do want to have uh, feedback from our patients and from others who are going, who may be going through the process in different programs. The uh, main thing that we all need to remember is uh, obesity and morbid obesity. It's a huge uh, problem and it's a disease. So you really have to work with uh, healthcare professionals, um, starting with your primary care, uh, adding nutritionists, dietitians, and depending on where you are, um, before it's too late, you may want to include the surgery. Uh, at that point, if your BMI is over 35, definitely. So because you want to get to the results uh, in the most uh, effective, efficient way, and that's why we are here. And we'll be back next week with a different topic, and thank you for watching us. Dr. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Kamal. Have a good weekend, everyone. Have a great weekend.